Welcome to Let's Talk Near Death, the podcast show where we talk about life, death, and experiences somewhere in between. My name is Kirsty Salisbury, the host of the show, and I welcome you to join me as I talk to everyday people with not so everyday experiences. You may also wish to join the conversation on the Let's Talk Near Death Facebook page or access additional VIP content as a premium subscriber via Patreon. For just a couple of dollars a month, you can get an early access to episodes, additional bonus content, and your chance to connect with my guests. To do so, simply visit patreon.com forward slash Kirsty Salisbury. Let's talk near death. I actually had an, a near death experience when I was three months old. And on my healing journey following my near-death experience in 2012, undergoing hypnotic regression type healing session, I remembered the experience when I was three months old. Today I'm joined by Jenny Jablonski who had a near-death experience when her lungs stopped working following a lengthy illness. Upon waking up from her experience, Ginny quickly recognised that she had begun to express remarkable intuitive abilities. Not only did she have these abilities, but she found that she was able to use them to connect with animals. Today, Ginny works with both humans and animals who have suffered from trauma, and she shares how the success of her work is accredited to it being rooted in love and forgiveness. Jenny Jablonski, welcome to Let's Talk Near Death. Thank you, Christy. I'm really pleased to be here. I'm excited to have you here, and I'm excited to hear about the animals because I love animals. I know a lot of experiences do, but I really just oh, I love them. Before we get into that, can you just take us back a little bit? Do you want to share where did this all happen? Where did your experience start? Well, unbeknownst to me, for the majority of my life, I actually had a near-death experience when I was three months old. I contracted whooping cough, and I was in the hospital. And when I was around 11 or 12 years old, my mother mentioned to me, you know, you almost died when you were a child. Oh, wow. And uh, I had been packed in ice in a tent, and I had turned completely blue, and it, it didn't look that good. And on my healing journey following my near-death experience in 2012, undergoing extensive therapy and energy medicine and alternative medicine and hypnotherapy, under uh, a, a hypnotic regression type healing session, I remembered the experience when I was three months old. Wow. And so what happened was I, I went back to the creator. It was one of those experiences that wasn't really dramatic. It was as if I was just in a, a velvety, warm, dark place. It it was just black. I didn't go through a ton of light or anything like that. And there was a presence that I can only describe as a booming voice, a warm light, but I can't say that I really saw a light. I just knew that there was a light presence. Mm a light present and that there was a presence and the voice was very, very warm and deep and booming. And when I went back, I apparently I knew it it was the creator. And I said, you know, I don't think I can do this life. This is going to be very difficult. Um, a, A life fraught with, drama and abuse and I don't think I can do this and we went back and forth boy it was six seven or eight times that I was fighting and crying and escalating in my in my anger and in my I would say fear 
I was crying and I was very emotional. And he kept telling me, you have to go back. There's something important you have to do. And eventually he decided that he would override me. But when he did send me back, he said, I will make you stronger to withstand what comes your way. Wow. And I, again, I didn't remember that until I believe it was the beginning of 2019 during a healing session, a regression session. And I became very almost hysterical. I mean, I was weeping, violently weeping and just releasing so much anger at being sent back. But during the experience, he kept telling me that I had to come back because there was something important I had to do. But I did not remember that my entire life. Mm -hmm. The, the next near-death experience was happened when I was 46 years old, uh, about eight, eight years ago. I did have two what people refer to as spiritually transformative experiences, uh, but nothing really came of that. They didn't transform me. They, and there are many other interviews where I go into um, detail about those experiences, but they didn't change my life. They didn't impress upon me uh, the necessity to be more loving or kind or, or to shift my awareness in any way. The big change for me happened in 2012 during a, a profound near-death experience. Mm, wow, there's quite a lot in there, isn't there? Are you happy to share this experience in 2012, what happened? Sure. Uh, prior to that, I had been a diplomatic protection agent in the 90s and at the turn of the millennium. And I got very sick. I didn't understand what was happening to me. I was very fatigued. I was exhausted. I wasn't exercising. And I, I went to the doctors and I asked them, you know, to fix me and send me back to work, really. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't find anything wrong with me. So eventually, I had to medically retire from my job, which was quite devastating. Mm -hmm. But I continued pursuing answers to try to heal so that I could go back to work. However, I didn't know that there was alternative medicine or alternative therapies or energy medicine or new age anything. I had never heard of that. Um, my husband had two degrees in science. I had majored but not completed my degree in economics. Um, and we were very, very much just into living life in quote unquote, the, the real world. Mm. So I, we believed that medical doctors knew everything. And, and as we all know, medical doctors don't really give us, ask us questions that would lead us down alternative paths. They just continue to do tests and prescribe medication. And that's what happened with me. I did refuse opioids and narcotics. Um, for the most part, for about eight or nine years until I finally in, uh, I medically retired in 2001. And in 2009, I accepted the opioids. And that's a very slippery slope. I was on uh, fentanyl uh, for four years. And it's an anesthetic that masks the neural pathways which carry the pain signals to the brain. So the body knows it's still in pain, so it just makes more neural pathways. It just enlarges the superhighway to send new signals of pain to mm -hmm. the brain. So when you're on opioids or fentanyl, uh, you just continue to require more. In about four years on opioids, um, it, it was very devastating what it did to my life and declining the quality of my life, etc. And four years in, I had a near-death experience where my brain forgot to tell my lungs to breathe when I was sleeping. Oh, wow. And wow. oddly enough, 
if you read the insert on the fentanyl package or you go on the FDA website, it actually says this medication can cause your brain to forget to tell your lungs to breathe. Wow. And yet you still were prescribed it and it's quite a common drug though, isn't it? Yes. Millions of people are on fentanyl, especially in the United States, Mm. millions of people. And there are uh, tens of thousands of fentanyl overdoses every, um, every month Mm. to to my knowledge. And and I do spend quite a bit of time speaking out against the overprescription of opioids now, but again, there are other interviews on my website. If people are interested in other work that I do, um, I'm always happy to share that information. Mm, great. So the near death experience, you, so your, your brain told your lungs to stop breathing. It, it basically forgets your brain forget your brain is anesthetized and it forgets to tell your lungs to breathe. Yes. So what happened there? Did you know that that was happening? Were you aware of anything or what, what was the next thing that you knew? It was, a, it was around 1.30 in the morning and I, it was the middle of the night. Um, I had also taken a prescription Dilaudid before I went to sleep and I had just had my uh, prescription dosages increased uh, within that week. So it was a a higher level of fentanyl and a higher level of Dilaudid. And I was in quite a bit of pain before I went to bed. So I took uh, the Dilaudid in addition to the fentanyl patch. And um, so it happened when I was sleeping. But my experience was that it's almost as if I woke up before it happened, I was lying in the dark, flat on the bed with my head against the headboard and the headboard was against the wall. And it was as if I could feel uh, someone at my shoulders and at my feet. And I, it startled me awake, but I didn't startle and, and sit up, but it, but it was enough to wake me up. And I was immediately propelled into a brilliant white space. Oh, wow. And I could immediately see a beautiful tree. Um, I can't say, I can't judge distances because it was so non-physical, really. There was no ceiling, mm-hmm. no floor, no, no reference point for distance but it didn't look too far away as if maybe it were maybe only 50 feet away, a beautiful, a large trunk, healthy, beautiful tree with deciduous leaves. I'm not sure what kind of tree it was. And there was a man walking toward me who looked very much like Jesus to me. He, he looked like all the religious paintings of Jesus. And he was walking toward me and I thought, yep, here I am. There's Jesus. I must be dead. <laughs> you know, it, it, it makes sense. I, I'm on a lot of medication, so it, this, this is it. This is it. And I thought, you know, I thought ironically about my husband. Um, now, he had been caring for me uh, quite extensively, and for me to worry about who would take care of him was was rather ironic, but I did I did think about that. Um, and Jesus held out his hand to me and said, "You've suffered enough. Your life is over. Come with me." And just as I was reaching out for his hand, and and as I'm speaking to you, I can. I can say that I I felt our fingertips. My hand was was reaching into his hand. We were touching. And I heard something behind me. And I I turned around to look and behind me were were horses and donkeys. And I had um I had been a horse lover, a horse owner. Um we we had a ranch. We rescued and rehabbed performance horses. I volunteered at a a sanctuary where there were 70 donkeys and Mm -hmm. 40 horses prior to my 
near death experience because I had placed one of my horses in the sanctuary. Mm-hmm. And e- even though I really had hardly any energy whatsoever, I could get out of bed and the sanctuary was about a mile, maybe a mile and a half from my house. And I would drive over and see my horse and, and brush my horse or take an apple. And um, I'd be there for a half an hour, 45 minutes, and I would go home. And um, in, in the beginning, I did it as often as I could. And then I became weaker and weaker toward the, the near-death experience. Mm-hmm. And eventually, about a month before the near-death experience, I did not go anymore to see my horse because I was just too exhausted. Mm-hmm. Mm, exactly. And so you're reaching out for Jesus. You hear the noise behind you. You turn around, there's the donkeys, the horses. Right. And, and you're aware that you're dead at this point because you were saying that you it made sense that you were dead. My consciousness is has very much reconciled the fact that it, it made sense that, that I was dead. It, right. it, it made sense. And I was pretty ready to go with Jesus. You know, I had been bedridden for the better part of eight or nine years, mostly bedridden. I mean, I could get up and do something for a half an hour or an hour, but to, to bathe and wash my hair and, you know, look presentable to leave the house would take enough energy that I barely had energy to go anywhere or do anything. Mm. Um, so when I, when I turned around, the donkeys and horses were on their hind legs and the donkeys were braying and the horses were neighing. And it was as if they were screaming in human language, don't go, don't go. Don't you remember there's something important you have to do. Now those are the same. I just have chills telling you that. Although I didn't remember at the time, those were the same words the creator used to me when I was three months old, there's something important you have to do. You have to go back. So when I heard the the donkeys and horses in a very human voice, just screaming, don't go, don't go, don't you remember? I turned back around to Jesus and I, I very demonstrably said, sorry, Jesus, I'm going with them. <laughs> And I was just immediately back in my body, just just like that. And I was hysterical. I was just, I shot up, which was difficult. You know, I couldn't just sit up in bed. I had to mm-hmm. sort of roll over and get my knees on the floor and push myself up. So mm-hmm. I was really shocked and, and just sh- shot up. And I started screaming at the top of my lungs. I just died. I just died. I just died over and over easily 20, maybe 30 times. I was just screaming. And of course I woke my husband up and my lungs were on fire. I I mean, I was just gasping for breath. It literally, it, it felt as if I had been burned, um, Mm -hmm. fire in the lungs and at the same time, my heart ached. It, it was an incredible pain, almost as if someone was just sitting on my chest, a very heavy, you know, I always say like a 300 pound man was sitting, not that I would know what that feels like, but that's the analogy I use, you know, yeah. like, like a 300 pound man was sitting on me and my heart hurt. And at the same time, my lungs were on fire. I was just hysterical. And I knew, I knew that I had died because here I was in my, in my room in Prescott, Arizona, you know, and um, so my husband asked, you know, well, are you okay now? Do we need to go to the hospital? Are you okay? And I said, no, I think, I think I'm okay. And then we resolved that we would discuss it in the morning. So. Wow, <laughs> such a major event to discuss in the morning. Yeah. I yeah. So, did you go back to sleep? You can't have gone back to sleep, right? Uh, well, I have to say, you know, my husband has Asperger's, which it's it's 
Yeah. You know, he, he's not a real emotional reactive person. So if somebody's not dying, there's really no urgency to just about anything. He's very yeah. calm and very logical and right. he needed to sleep, you know? Yeah. And I know I've been married to my husband for 25 going on 26 years now. So I knew that it, it was not going to work to get up in the middle of the night and talk about this. So did I go back to sleep? I may have drifted off, but it felt as if I just laid there staring yeah. at this, you know, stiff armed, fists clenched, you know, just waiting for the opportunity to share what happened. Yeah, I'm sure. And so what was going through your mind that time from when you've woken up, you come back to your body till the morning when you have that opportunity to talk about it? Were you afraid? A lot of conflicting thoughts. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. Were you afraid at all? That's part of the conflict, I think. I don't, I don't feel that I was afraid. I, I feel as if I had a lot of very good, logical questions going through my mind. Mm. And I had a lot of very illogical, nonsensical questions going through my mind. And, you know, I'm a Virgo. I, you know, I studied economics and I, I worked in accounting when I was younger. And I'm a really sort of numbers, statistical, logical left brain person, or at least I used to be. Mm. And what I thought was, do I want to live? And what do I have to live for? And if I want to live, how can I get off of this medication? Because I know that the medication is going to kill me. Mm. That's the one primary thought that I had. And so when you, when you recovered from this experience, maybe not full recovery in terms of health, but recovered from the fact that you understood you'd had the experience, you were back in your body and you were there to stay. You said that you had some newfound abilities that you were able to communicate in different ways and that you had some new intuitive abilities. Right. And my husband and I both thought I was crazy. We, we never knew anybody that talked about anything like this. We both thought, um, that it was the medication. It was it was very concerning. It, it was as if plants and animals would talk to me, and I am certain that there would be dead people in random places, and they would be attracted to me and come and talk to me. Wow. Um, what was that like in the beginning? Was that a, that must have been frightening? You know, it never really was frightening for me i i kept trying to understand it i wanted to i wanted to define everything that was happening because to me it was fascinating and mm. i believed it because like the animals would look at me and they would have you know facial expressions <laughs> or when they mm. were communicating um and the knowing the deep knowing the, the, the clear cognizance that just you know so strongly in your bones when something is true or real, mm. it, for me it was very real. But it didn't mean that I didn't think maybe it was because of the drugs. <laughs> yeah, Like exactly. a lot of people, I think, and I certainly can't, know who the audience is or the people that purchase the books about NDEs, but I've talked to other NDEers. I've spoken at NDE conferences. I've, I try not to read too many books because I don't want to project other people's experience on mine or mine on theirs, etc. But one thing I know is that if you have an NDE and you don't know what that is, you've never heard NDE before, you sort of think, why has this happened to me? Am I, you know, you're in this sort of temporarily fog, confusion, excitement, you know, why did this happen to me? And, and you want to go on a spiritual journey to find out what it all means. Mm -hmm. 
So in that, in that regard, I didn't, I didn't doubt it, but I didn't understand that it's common for people that have NDEs to come back with certain gifts or a connection to the other side or to, to have a mission to, to bring forward messages or to be more aware. In, in, in many cases, the NDE is, for me, I can speak for myself, it's both a gift and sort of a last-ditch effort to help me figure it out in this life. And it's, it's basically like someone helping you sort of throw your leg up over the horse. Mm. You, you know, you, you can't do it by yourself, but you get propelled, propelled into the position where now you have the information, but I had no context. I had no spiritual, religious, life experience context in which to to define or validate anything that was happening to me. Mm. So had you, you know, said, sorry, carry on. No, I was just gonna say, you know, sadly in the beginning I kind of went around to people and said, oh, does this happen to you? You know, do you hear voices? You know, and and it didn't go over that well. So for a while for a while I didn't say anything to anybody, but I started to to try to buy books or research mm -hmm. on the internet and find also contemporaneously, I was trying to get myself off of drugs. And I had told my husband, you know, I'm not, I don't have faith in my allopathic doctors anymore. We have to find out if there's something beyond traditional medicine. And that journey was really incredible. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to, to meet a lot of people though I didn't have personal recommendations or referrals or, and really an understanding, I was just picking, you know, a, a, a personality from the internet or, or somebody from, you know, the, the current spiritual store uh, or the, the local store or um, down in Phoenix, et cetera. And so I was very open. I was very open to all of these discussions and, I wasn't predisposed to any specific system of belief as to how the universe works, why we're here, what the energy construct of the human body is. I, you know, I, I saw a lot and I heard a lot and almost nothing I experienced explained everything I was seeing. Mm. So, for example, mm -hmm. if I was working with someone with a Hindu or a yogic or, um, you know, a, a, a Buddhist background, for example, when we're speaking of pranic medicine or the chakra system, um, I would see more than their information could explain. So it, it was part of the answer, but not everything that I was seeing because I was seeing a jumbled mess of color and chakras and meridians and the nervous system and other cultural and spiritual energetic constructs that I had no reference point for until, you know, years into studying and continuing to ask, well, okay, I, yes, I understand that these chakra systems exist and there are major system, chakras and minor chakras, but I keep seeing another system that has primary energy centers in the joints, in the ankles and the knees and the hips or the wrists and the elbows. And so what is that? And I just kept asking until somebody said, oh, I think that's the Mayan energetic construct. And the Mayan energy, so I that went and studied with one of the indigenous grandmothers who has um, a Mayan training over 50 or 60 years of Mayan training from the time she was two years old, born in Central America. And I came to understand that energetic construct. So it was a really interesting experience. And 
what continued to propel me forward was that even though so many people thought they had the answer, this is it, this is how the universe works, this is, you know, whether the unified field theory and quantum physics or from a, a shamanic perspective, just about the luminous energy field, which is very analogous to the toroidal electromagnetic energy field that is uh, mirrored from the human to the earth, etc., cetera, um, or is a mirrored copy of or a reflection of the earth's electromagnetic field, mm -hmm. the toroidal field. And even though so many people felt very strongly you know, you need to stick with me. I have all the answers. I just sort of knew that there was more and there was always something more. And it really propelled me forward to study many different things. It, it was really fascinating. Now, I know you're probably really enjoying this episode, but I wanted to pop in and let you know how you can further support the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. Every little bit of input helps me. It encourages me. And it enables me to be able to bring in more guests, share more episodes, and release more content. If you're financially able, you can pop over and become a VIP subscriber for just a couple of dollars a month. If not, you may want to consider leaving a review on iTunes, sharing an episode with a friend, or connecting over with the Let's Talk Near Death Facebook page. Every little bit of input helps me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. And I hope you enjoy the rest of this episode. Yeah, I'm just thinking as you're talking now, I was thinking, gosh, you have learned so much. All these systems that you're talking about, everything that you've you've had to learn. And so you were getting glimpses of these things with no prior knowledge of them. Is that correct? That's correct. I, For example, I didn't have any training in traditional Chinese medicine but I could see meridians like a golden superhighway, or I could see from inside the human body if one mm. of the meridians was, let's just say, clogged up with what looked like honey or molasses, yeah, you know, wow. something sticky, a sticky energy. And I would hear words that would describe um, what was what was the distorted energy that was blocking the meridian. And when I would hear the description, if it was an emotion or a feeling and it would have um, a relationship to the stomach or the spleen or the kidneys or, you know, the respiratory system or the heart, when I looked into it, it was always in alignment with what was taught. Mm. And so I did, I did, take great pains to go and study some of these things once I became aware of them. But mm -hmm. at certain points, I realized either I was told by the masters that I wanted to train with, you really don't need to train with me because you already see this and you're using your intuition to know it. So studying where everything is will just predispose you to a protocol mm. or to believing it has to be a certain way, whereas your guidance and your knowing is is really what your strength is mm, and good. so sometimes i was sort of steered away e even from the masters and the teachers from really going really far down the road in a specific topic like taking a deep dive i always say i i never took a real deep dive in any one of the healing modalities there are 35 major religions and you know philosophies in the world and i've only studied really at the novice level about 11 or 12 and I have some sort of minor knowledge about others only because I've experienced through working with people mm. you know that that um, either had those beliefs or I've met them in um uh, spiritual groups where people get together, like-minded people get together to talk about things. And it's, it's fascinating, but maybe I didn't learn all of the terminology and the protocol. Mm. I love that you're talking about beliefs because as you were sharing your experience itself and meeting Jesus, while well, seeing Jesus and reaching out your hand, I was wondering in my head, I wonder what her spiritual upbringing was. Mm -hmm. So were you, how were you raised? Did you have any set beliefs before your near-death experience? Well, I did. Um, 
And it was it was a rocky road when I was a child. I was born into a, a family that uh, attended the Methodist church. And so I was baptized Methodist. And we went to Sunday school. And I remember I got to the point in Sunday school where the Sunday school teacher, I think I might have been 10 or 11. So I guess that's fifth grade, maybe. Mm. Um and I was born sort of late in the year, so I was always the oldest in my class, I, you know, where it might have been better for me to be in the year prior class. And uh, we got in the point, uh, we got to the point in Sunday school where it said, if you don't accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you go to hell, you know. And so I immediately raised my hand and I said to the teacher, well, what about the people in China? I was at least aware, you know, at that mm -hmm. age, there were people in other parts of the world that practice other religions. Don't know how I knew that. Mm -hmm. But um, and what you know, what about them? And she said, oh, no, nope, they go to hell. And oh. I just went home and told my mom, I don't I don't think I can do this anymore. This doesn't make sense. Why would God be a punishing God or a vengeful God if someone doesn't have the opportunity. So after that, um, I didn't have, I wasn't invested in religion because mm -hmm. it didn't seem fair and it didn't make sense to me. I'm not saying it's, it's wrong or right. It just, for my little girl brain, it, it didn't seem right. So do you have any insight then as to why you would see Jesus in this experience? It's a big question. I, th I think I think that was my. I think that was m my representation of you know Christ's consciousness or God the Father. I, I, I you know I think that at the foundational level Christianity was my primary system re religious system of belief that I was exposed to, and it. It made sense. Um, it I didn't question it. It made sense to me in yeah. in the near death that it, that that would be Jesus. Yeah, yeah, it does make sense. Mm -hmm. And so then, as you're you're reaching out to Jesus, you've got the animals behind you, and they're communicating not to not to leave, not to go. So that's to go with Jesus, right? Yes. Yeah. Don't, yeah. Don't go. Don't leave your body. Don't leave your life. So then you ended up back in your body. You follow, you went with the animals. I, I know I've really just pushed that right down there. You're with the animals. You end up back with your body. When you woke up in your body or even in the days, weeks, years following, were you aware of the purpose and how that connected with the animals? No. In fact, I forgot about the animal piece for quite some time. Uh-huh. As I said, my thoughts were very much, do I want to live? And if so, how can I accomplish that? In order to live, I have to get off of the medicine. Mm -hmm. And so that next morning, and I apologize if I am jumping jumping around a, no, a little bit. No, it's great. Bit. It's great. Um, the next morning, I sat with my husband after he had his coffee. <laughs> and um, I said, I can't say why I believe this, but I think I have something important to do and I, I really want to live. Yeah. And I, I always say, you know, it made, and it almost, almost always makes me get a little teary and I apologize, but really it made no logical sense to say that there's something important I have to do when I had basically no quality of life. I I mostly was in bed watching HGTV. I couldn't ride horses anymore. I certainly couldn't train horses anymore. I wasn't driving a car at night anymore. Um, I had, uh, you know, pr prior to, um, right after I retired, I did a lot of volunteering in my community, advocating for children with special, uh, you know, with disabilities, with special mm -hmm. needs. I wrote grants. I served on nonprofit boards. I, um, you know, promoted or spoke out against bond measures, et cetera, for the local school district, you name it. And I had a full life when I was no longer working, but that only 
lasted a few years. And when I began to take the opioids, the quality of my life significantly declined. Mm. So for me to say there was something important I had to do, it really was, it really made no sense. What could I do? I, you know, I could barely get myself out of bed and mm. take a shower and hold my arms up and, you know, dry my hair. You know, um, and in fact, because of that, I had cut my hair very, very short because I didn't have the energy, you know, to hold a hair dryer and dry mm -hmm. my hair. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm quite proud of the fact that I have it's looking dry. <laughs> the energy to dry, dry my hair now, you know, yeah. only a woman would understand that. But um, so I didn't remember uh, the animal piece of it. What happened was uh, on the journey when I was being healed and, and I was lucky that my husband, you know, allowed me to spend our money, his life savings on this healing journey. Mm -hmm. When I was working with the, the different healers, they would, I would sometimes be giving them messages or I would be narrating when they were working with me, you know, what the, how the energy was moving in my body and what was happening. And they said, you know, you're a healer. You need to be doing this work. Well, I, I was smart enough and level headed enough and, and humble enough because boy, let me tell you when you're bedridden and you're on medication and you know, you almost have no will to live, you become humble real fast, mm -hmm. you know, to know that I was in no position to be giving anybody else advice and having met amazing masters, teachers, um, you know, very well educated people who had studied these healing modalities for 15 years, 20 years, you know, 30 years, some of them, I felt a little bit like if I tried to step into that arena, A, I wasn't healed enough. And B, it would seem a little bit like I was a fraud, like, oh, yeah, I just had a near death experience. And now I get all this magical information. And, you know, you know, on now here I am to solve somebody's problems. Well, I still needed to solve my own problems. So I wasn't really ready to put myself in that position. But I kept being asked by the healers, or they would say, Hey, I have a client, I think you can help or will you work with me? And I do give and I always have given really germane, very specific, very helpful information. Mm -hmm. And I can see, sense and feel energies that are trapped in the body, especially people who have experienced trauma or abuse. Because mm -hmm. as I healed myself from trauma and abuse, in a way, I think that was legitimate and validated, but thoughtful, Mm -hmm. um, I was able to really sort of unpack it in so many different ways and experience so many different healing modalities that it was, it was hard for me to say no. Mm -hmm. So I did begin to work with people, but I didn't want to charge a lot of money either because I felt like, well, this is, you know, is it Jesus or somebody gave me a gift, you know, let me share this gift. But what happened was I was charging so little money. I was busy and had clients all over the world within months, within months, just word of mouth. And, you know, s some people that do this work can charge, you know, anywhere from $300, $500, $1,000 hour, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was only asking, like, well, do you have $25? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it was just as valid, just as you know, incredible, just as, just as healing. Um, and it, it kind of took over my healing process for a while. And so I wanted to, to back off and give myself more time to continue doing my healing. Mm -hmm. And in that time, animals started coming to me. And when I was working with other people, it seemed like their animals would sort of, I would say like they would bomb the session, you know, or they would sort of butt in, yeah, you know, and I'd be like, oh, Christy, you know, did you have a white cat? Did you have a, a dead cat? Because if I could tell they're dead if they have wings, you, you know what I mean? Oh, and if they're wow. alive, they, they don't have wings, you know, and so sometimes you actually I see know, the wings. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Sometimes they look almost like a, a gray and white cartoon, like a ghostly sort of. And it's like, yeah, yeah I don't think they're physical. I think they're non-physical. Wow. And depending on the amount of distortion, you know, the, the light looks different. Yeah. But, um, but I would just say, well, you know, there's a cat in your energy field and we have to talk to this cat because the cat's really agitated. Or do you have a horse that's alive right now because he's something, you know, upset about something that's going on in the pasture? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, do you have a dog? Or I'm seeing three dogs, two look like they're alive and one has wings, you know, and people just start bursting, you know, out in tears like, oh, oh yes, wow. you know, and yeah. um, and and they would give the animals would give just such incredible messages um, and many different kinds of messages. Sometimes it would be, I'm with you all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just always with you. I've never left you. Sometimes it would be, you know, sometimes you wake up and you think you have a great idea, but really it was me whispering in your ear, (laughs) giving you the great idea. And sometimes it would be sort of advice, like, you know, you, it's, it's really important. You're really putting off, you know, your health or your physical health, or um, you're not eating healthy, or there's something about the relationship, you know, or you haven't forgiven your father, you you know, Mm -hmm. that type of thing. Um, And a lot of times it, it was very healing and very moving and wonderful for the people. But from my perspective, it was a little bothersome because it took, I felt like, Hey, this is taking a lot of time from me working with the people. Yeah. Yeah. My father, I'm busy here. (laughs) Exactly. I felt like they were stealing my thunder, I guess, you know? And so I went to, to my teachers and, And I had Akashic Records readings and hypnotic regression. And, you know, one day I was just meditating. Why are all these animals coming in, you know, Mm. and bothering me? Mm. And all of a sudden, all these horses sort of came right, right in my face. And they said, don't you remember? You're supposed to be working with us. And we've been guiding you on your journey. Oh, and you really wow. need to stop. You need to put the books down. You need to stop reading books because the more you read and the more you learn, right, the protocol and the science, mm. it takes you further away from us. Yeah. So that's when I realized, okay, maybe I need to start calling myself an animal communicator too. Yeah. Was that quite unusual? Were you aware of other people who had done that? Yes. Now, the animals, remember, had been talking to me almost since my near-death experience. I was having all kinds of experiences. And every once in a while, you know, if I was in someone's house and a cat walked through the room, I would just say, um, you know, oh, you're, you're calling your cat Veda. Your cat's name is Veda. Your cat's telling me his name is actually Ayurveda, not Veda, or you know something like that. Oh, wow. um, and so I would, I always gave little snippets, but I never sat, you know, and connected and had a conversation and asked the soul, you know, what do you need and how can I be of service to you? That type of thing. It was more, I was living my life really with blinders on, you know, just sort of head down. And I just wanted to live. And I have to be honest, it, it, it became, I guess, a bit of an obsession to heal because there was a lot to heal, not only the PTSD and the trauma, but degenerative disc and joint disease, Lyme disease, you know, overcoming all of this Mm. and having no faith whatsoever in doctors, which meant I didn't go to a naturopath. I didn't go to a homeopath. I didn't go to an osteopath. Mm. You know, I, I, I withheld that type of alternative treatment for, because of my lack in the medical doctors after all those years. Mm. So I tried to heal completely through use of alternative means and alternative healing, which 
wasn't able to get me the whole way home. And I, I'm still working on certain things. I did not come back magically healed as a lot mm. of people who have near death experiences do. Some people come back and they start healing right away. And within weeks, you know, from broken bones to cancer to different diseases. And for me, the purpose was more of a journey to be able to have these types of broad discussions which lead us really to my conclusion, and that is a healer is a person who opens a space for you to facilitate healing. In other mm -hmm. words, I can offer a space, offer tools, share information, but it's up to the person who's engaging my services to choose to heal or resist healing or, you know, to internalize that and to do with that what they will, <clears throat> which mm -hmm. I find is why when I paid all that money in the beginning, the first year, I probably spent between 50 and 60 grand easily, easily. And I just laid on people's tables and I said, okay, heal me. I'm ready. Heal me. I, yeah. You never met anybody that wanted to heal more than me. Come on, let's <laughs> yeah. do it. You know? And, you know, because I have something important to do, although I have no idea what it is, I'm ready, heal me. And nothing anybody did ever worked because I was giving my power away and I was just laying there having no clue what really needed to happen. Mm. And, you know, what, generally speaking, what needs to happen for most of us is, you know, a, a look inward and compassion and forgiveness and releasing, you know, emotions that are trapped that are creating a distortion or disease. Mm. And, and I just didn't know that. And so when you started to work with the animals and you started to do what is more aligned with your purpose, the reason you came back, did you notice any difference in your personal healing and what was happening in your own body? Yes. Um, it's almost as if I started to fast track. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Yeah. Now I have a lot of problems with with my spine and bulging discs. And, and I, you know, I don't have um, the ability to go, you know, to jog or, or walk even, you know, more than a couple of blocks. I still mm -hmm. have degenerative disc and joint disease and that type of thing. So I'm not to the place yet where all the quantum healing visualization <laughs> techniques are completely healing every part of my body. Mm. But I, I can go a whole day with, you know, without taking a nap often, you know, days and days and days in a row. Um, I've flown around, you know, different places around the globe. I, mm. I've traveled across the country um, I'm able to to work with uh, you know a couple of uh, horses a day, um, and then I just rest for a day or two, mm -hmm. and then you know I just add in rest days in my schedule. So I might rest for a day or two, and then I'll pack up and go to the airport and fly to another city or or drive to another city. But I make it very short short stints. And you know I'm very lucky. I have friends all across the U.S. I um, I volunteer at uh, sanctuaries all across the U.S. So when I'm speaking, I might um, <clears throat> combine speaking engagements and and maybe some time visiting friends, and then maybe I'll go to a barn and you know work with a horse or two, and I'll rest for a couple of days because it all takes it all takes mm. it, it out of you, you know. Mm, absolutely, I'm really enjoying. There's a strong theme of self love that you're talking about here, which is something that comes up time and time again when I'm doing these interviews. Has that been a big thing for you, the self-love piece? Did that take a while to get there? Yes, and I have to say, you know, it's easier than it sounds. Yeah, I <laughs> because know. Because <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think a lot of, I think unfortunately there's a lot of people who say, oh, you know, just meditate, go within, find the answers mm -hmm. that way. And speaking from my experience and speaking from the perspective of a person who had a lot of trauma and and abuse in their life and different kinds of abuse over many, many years. Um, and, and, and a life almost really void of love or validation or support. Right. Mm. Um, 
there are layers and layers and layers of unworthiness and doubt and mm. anger and unforgiveness and and events that need to be peeled away and you know in the first few years if if somebody tried to tell me oh just lay there i'm going to hypnotize you or we're going to do you know pranayama some sort of yogic breath work or um you know i'm going to walk you through a meditation i, I couldn't lie still not mm. only was my physical body in pain and then i refused drugs you know i got mm. myself off of drugs probably too quickly against medical advice mm. you know <laughs> and um and so i just sort of tough it out which probably for me made it a little worse, but I couldn't, I couldn't have someone control my breath. I couldn't just lie still because someone was telling me to lie still. It was as if I would have a panic attack and it was all of the, my nervous system was just constantly on, on high alert. I was constantly mm -hmm. in the sympathetic, not the parasympathetic. There was no rest and digest. It was, I was in fight or flight and it took a long time. Now, luckily I didn't have a nine to five job. I, I was able to, to travel, even though I didn't have a lot of energy, we had the money that I could, you know, if I was in Florida, I could, you know, just sleep for three or four days in a hotel and then go do something for two days and then sleep for, you know, two or three days or, you know, lay by the pool or whatever, and then come home. Mm -hmm. But I would go to workshops and I would go to conventions and, and I would, um, I, I of course downloaded every podcast podcast or webcast and yeah. you know I signed up for a, a number of classes and and went to different you know healing certification programs yeah. and and that type of thing and and now I don't really use protocols or healing modalities per se um whatever comes up, whatever is presented to me is the language that I speak in. And that generally will reflect the language that the person prefers mm. Mm. Or, or the animal. But in terms of the animals, I think working with the animals did two things for me. It did help me on my healing journey quite a bit. And it yeah. expanded my, what I would call my abilities, you know, uh, clear sentience, clear audience, clear cognizance, clairvoyance. I have extraordinary clairvoyant, clear cognizant, clear audience abilities. Um, and I remember two years ago calling my husband and just saying, "Honey, you wouldn't believe my my abilities are skyrocketing." I, I you know I heard this and I saw this and. And I would say that every week, every month. And even a few weeks ago, I, I mentioned to my husband, it's incredible the way things are opening and the energies are shifting and how it's so much easier to heal certain things or, or know or perceive in, in, in ways that were never available to me before. Mm. So mm. working with the animals but not just working with them to get something from them being in service and saying yes you know, mm -hmm. having them say, will you work with us? And me saying yes. And every time I've been asked, will you help this person? Will you work with this person? Will you help this animal? I never say no. I might not be able to do it today or this week, but I never say no. Mm -hmm. So I always say yes to spirit so that I feel that when I ask, I get a yes back. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. It must be so lovely to spend all that time with animals as well. I think they're quite healing. Like I, I've got a beautiful little cat and I've got a dog too, but my cat, he comes and he just has cuddles all the time. And I just love to feel him on my knee and I stroke his head and his purring, like he's nonstop, he's a little motor mouth, nonstop purring. And I've often mm -hmm. thought, I bet that purring is actually a vibrational something that's doing something really great for all the people that he goes and spends time with. Do you think that that is the way it is? Do you think animals are here to help us on the healing journey? Not all of them. I think some of them, I mm -hmm. think with, with respect to cats, um, I find more often than not that cats tell me that their mission is to ground a certain frequency on the earth. Okay. And through the vibration of their purring 
And so, you know, there are many, many, many different kinds of healing and there's vibrational healing, sound healing, yeah. um, bio, bio field tuning. So I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's basically using sound and vibration such as tuning forks to um, clear energy and distortion in the energy field. And um, one way of looking at the energy field is to, to not look at the subtle bodies, the chakras, the meridians, and other types of energy centers, but to look at the energy field as the luminous energy field, as indigenous, some indigenous peoples refer to it. And in biofield tuning and biofield healing, um, there's a lovely woman from Canada. I apologize for not remembering her name right now. But what she has done is she has identified, and I think this is nothing new. I think sh I know that shaman in, in training with shaman from around the world, from Siberia to Peru, quite frankly, I know that they knew how energy is sort of categorized in the energy field. So if it's here on the left or it's here on the right or it's down low or above or what have you, um, certain energy, certain distortions, certain patterns are stored in certain places in the energy field. Um, mm. So uh, you can actually use vibration or frequency and different, um, different frequencies. So the different size tuning forks relate to different frequencies, different megahertz, et cetera. And you can clear frequencies in that way. Um, and so I think some of the animals are doing that, but I also think some people are doing that as well. Certain people are grounding, just grounding unconditional love, grounding light, bringing forward. I spoke with a client on the phone. I think it might have been this morning. And she just kept hearing peace, peace, peace. Oh, wow. And that's that's her frequency. It's a frequency of peace. And it's almost as if we're, we're just emitting, you know, these frequencies. And some animals do that. Um, some animals are quite traumatized from experiences in domestication. And they don't even remember what their purpose is. And it, there's a lot, I think, um, of, of, you know, I hesitate to say misinformation because it really depends on your belief system. Mm. You know, if, if certain people only communicate with that, that higher soul aspect of the animal, you're never going to hear that anything is wrong or that they're upset or that they're in pain. You're just going to hear beautiful messages. Mm. But if you tap into their heart space and their throat chakra and their body where they're carrying trauma and wounds you'll get a lot of information about um, the ways in which they have been treated or they've had certain shock or trauma or experiences, you know, so it really depends on who you're working with as, as to what information comes through and, and what you might be told is the animal's purpose. Mm. Mm. It's very interesting. I've really enjoyed chatting with you today. You've got a very full experience, so I'm aware of all of the different levels. We're talking about the spiritual experience, the physical healing journey for you, the healing journey with the animals that you're working with. Then there's the emotional side. It's definitely got to have affected relationships. You've lost your job over some things. Then there's the addiction to... Actually, addiction is probably not the right word, is it? The need for the prescription medicine and then pulling yourself off that. There's so many different layers to your experience. And I really appreciate that you've come on today and shared all of this with us. I've loved talking about the animals and I'm thinking about my little cat right now. <laughs> it's been wonderful. Is there one key message? Is there one thing that sticks out as the key message that you want to share with the world after everything that you've experienced and where you are today? I think that we're taught that the way that we're living, if maybe I should just take advantage of the fact that we're all going through the coronavirus pandemic lockdown yeah. right now, you know, and 
the way that we were brought up, I'm almost 54. So I was just brought up that you go to high school, you go to college, you get a job, you raise a family, you know, you work hard on the weekends, you, you know, you, you clean the house, you work in the lawn or, you know, and you get two weeks vacation Mm -hmm. a year, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I was never exposed to other cultures and other religions where they really value family, community, um, energy management, self-awareness, mindfulness, and and those types of things. Mm -hmm. And I would just ask people to question thoughtfully, you know, and I don't mean to be rude or disrespectful, but just to to question what are we valuing? What is most important to us? And are we sacrificing our health, our sanity, our... um, our, you know, our, our mind, our, our sovereignty really to systems that someone else has told us is how we should live. That mm. I think that with enough intent, we can make shifts, even if they're small shifts to, to our lifestyle and our perspective. And for, for me, I never had any any inkling that that was possible, that I could control my environment or my energy. And I feel like that's an important message of this time that, Mm. you know, to rebuild a a connection, a relationship with nature, if we can, if it's possible, even if it means getting a house plant because we live in a high rise in a city, (laughs) you you know what I mean? Or maybe getting a cat, you, you know, Um, I feel like that's very important because there's so much more than just the nine to five obligation and expectation. There is so much more, isn't there? I love, I love that. Thank you. And I think you're right. Right now as we're in lockdown, as we're globally going through the coronavirus, the COVID-19 it is such a great place to be able to push pause and just reassess everything. And like you say, understand that there are the other opportunities, other ways that things can happen. Right. It's beautiful. Ginny Jablonski, thank you so much for your time today. This has been wonderful. We wish you all the best. I can't wait to hear more stories in the future and just how we can continue to be connected to spirit as well as the physical beings at the same time understand that animals can help to heal that animals need healing themselves and everything we've talked about today i'm just going to go away and sort of sit on that for a little bit because there's so much in this conversation so jenny thank you so much thank you thanks for joining me on this episode of the let's talk near death podcast show if you've enjoyed it Please share it with your friends, tell people about it. I'd love to get these messages out there. Don't forget you can also pick up your VIP access pass for additional content at patreon.com forward slash Kirsty Salisbury. You can connect with us via the Let's Talk Near Death Facebook page and I look forward to catching you for another episode soon.